Everything is just loading. Okay, great. So, um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, hmm. Let's see. Hopefully, I'm getting some sound on my... Uh, And I swear, let's see, let's do that. Yeah, okay, so hopefully I'm getting some sound on my mic on my, uh, on my YouTube live. Anyway, so I am live uh, because I am going to be, as I have been for a couple of months now, reading from the book, <clears throat> The Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth. However, I am um, digressing um, from my normal programming because the last chapter I read was, let's see, was half of chapter, let's see, fine, God is not going get, okay, so yeah, it was half of chapter 38, God as Father. But in light of recent events um, that everybody is talking about, the reversal of Roe versus Ray, I thought I would go forward um, several chapters just to go ahead and read this chapter because um, it is highly relevant. So for those of you who are just joining in, this is the Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth. Um, it's late here, so you guys might not see this until tomorrow. But maybe let me just tell you. The book was written in 1987 by uh, Monica Zhu and Barbara Moore. And um, this chapter is highly relevant. This was in 87. This chapter is highly relevant given in the year 2022. 2020, 2022. The uh, Supreme Court would overturn um, Roe versus Wade. So we're going to read today. This is chapter 49 of The Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth, written in 1987. This is the chapter entitled The Machine. Three connected phenomena are happening all around us in the very modern world of the 1980s. They are one, the rise to power of fundamentalist sects Christian, 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 Judaic, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, and Confucian, and their collusion with business and military-dominated governments in directing theological and political attacks on women's rights, in particular, women's rights to control our reproductive capacities. Two, the particular women's rights to control our reproductive capacities. Um, excuse me. In particular, the women's rights to the growth and global distribution of reproductive technologies, everything from birth control pills, IUDs, and coercive sterilization programs dumped on third world women, to the expensive and complex Western technologies of making sterile women pregnant through transplantation of unfertilized eggs and embryos from the ovaries and wombs of egg mothers, um, to the wombs of host mothers and the correlative genetic engineering of, in of embryos to make babies to order. And three, the spread of American corporate structures and advanced production technologies into global factories where virtually trapped workers, over 80% of them women, work and often live behind the barbed wire wall controlled in both work and private life by a corporation government collusion that forbids them union organization or political protest and often extends to the economic control of their reproductive lives, i.e. multinational corporations give preferential, uh, preferential employment to single women without children with no plans to have children. In India's textile industry, employers prefer women who've been sterilized through the government's population control program. And in Bataan, export processing zone in the Philippines, the Mattel company offers prizes to women workers making toys and Barbie dolls who undergo sterilization. <clears throat> These three trends might seem disconnected, even sometimes publicly antagonistic, but in truth, they are profoundly linked. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Their linkage can be traced back to the Bronze Age, to the, to the practical beginnings of patriarchy at the end of the Neolithic, when men first began to organize to gain systematic control over one, women's production, and two, women's reproduction. As we've said, the definition of the female body under patriarchy corresponds to the definition of the worker's body under private capitalist, e.g. American, or state capitalist, e.g. Soviet, production systems. Come on now. Come on into church, y'all. At the beginning of the Bronze Age patriarchy, males began to take over women's ancient inventions and improving them, i.e. capitalizing them by turning systemat turning rhythmic local qualitative handcraft work into quantitative mechanized mass production for trade and for the building of wealth. Simultaneously, patriarchal men moved to take over and improve, i.e. capitalize the most primal production of all, the female's production of children modeling their religious and practical notions on their new experience of cattle breeding, men redefined the ontologically and autonomously create a female body into a machine for the producing of wealth. That is wealth for men via the patrifocal family in the form of children as inheritors of patrilineal control, patrilineally controlled property and children who could be used to make more wealth as workers or traded for wealth in the form of female bodies traded as wives. Patriarchal religion grew side by side with patriarchal wealth and secular power. The father God's male priesthoods rationalized and sacralized the pastoralistic control and use of women's bodies, of women's bodies as wealth breeding machines simultaneous with cattle breeding, spiritually programming generations of both women and men to believe that God was now a male who wanted it this way. The Neolithic goddess religions that had supported female sexual autonomy, female control over both sexual pleasure and reproduction, were religiously demonized and politically destroyed. With the growth and, and elaboration of tribes into nations, in, uh, tribe, wait, elaboration of tribes into nations, into empires, structural systemic control of female reproduction passed from the private hands of fathers and husbands into the functional machinery of state political economies. Male rulers attempted at least to regulate populations according to state and business fluctuations. The need for increase or decrease in labor forces and armies for more consumers of surplus or fewer consumers of famine, etc. Y'all ain't heard. God damn it. Y'all are not hearing. When I'm telling you I'm reading this book, I'm taking you to church. We are in, listen, we in service right now. Listen, it's saying here, let me reread, let me reread this last little, this last little sentence. With the growth and elaboration of tribes into nations, into empires, structural systemic control of female reproduction passed from the private hands of fathers and husbands into the functional machinery of state political economies. Male rulers attempted at least to regulate populations. Their attempts to regulate populations according to state and business fluctuations, the need for increase or decrease of labor forces and armies for more consumers of surplus or fewer consumers of famine. For over 4,000 years now, female reproduction has not been an autonomous function of women, but an auxiliary function of patriarchal systems. And for the same time, and for the same time period, worker production has functioned as a part of the same patriarchal hierarchic wealth producing machinery. <clears throat> Both female reproduction and worker production being rationalized and reified by God, i.e. religious dogmas of priesthoods and theologians as subsidiary and inferior functions of that wealth producing system. They are subsidiary and inferior functions in the sense that they are the disempowered many controlled by the system to the benefit of the empowered few. 
As for wealth, as far as far as wealth production or actual value goes, females and workers are, of course, not subsidiary or inferior in any way, but primary producers of all wealth. Come on. Come on. In both cases, worker production and female reproduction, wealth is produced for the uh, for the dominant males or the dominating male system with its auxiliary wives. By organizing what was once organically rooted sexual, spiritual activity into coerced mechanical reproductive activity. <coughs> Excuse me. The cyclic dance of impassioned bodies is forcibly and moralistically restructured, come on, restructured into the chain gang of numb bodies forming an assembly line or a maternity ward. Human biological and dream energies once numinous ends in the once numinous ends in themselves are co-opted and rechanneled into profit-making results via a collusion of religious and governmental political ideologies that manipulate the body and the spirit of humanity away from conditions or experiences of evolutionary revolutionary ecstasy and into conditions and experiences of counter-evolutionary, revolutionary, re re productive repression. Both worker production and female reproduction are controlled and directed by the same forces, sexual, spiritual, ideological systems of piety and drudgery, which are themselves uh, tele uh, teleological machines producing just enough energy to rationalize themselves automatically while maintaining themselves in power. Oh my God. Piety and drudgery reinforce each other by dogmatically, um, physically, and habitually repressing energy to a mere subs subsistent level, a, sus a subsistence level that is capable only of piety and drudgery, i.e. incapable of revolutionary ecstasy or creativity necessary to escape the subsistence level system the piety and and piety and drudgery is the nominative is the normative state of being in which females and workers have been kept under patriarchy for at least 4000 years finally this condition is the result of the bronze age patriarchal re redefinition of the female body from organic autonomous creator to male controlled breeding machine Technological or systemic, uh, systematic ideological control of human labor could not exist if control of female reproductive labor did not pre-exist. Come on. For control of organic and autonomous female reproduction is structurally necessary to create the mechanical state of piety and drudgery out of, out of the repressed sexual spiritual energies, i.e., all machines, including all mechanizations, need fuel, and all fuel is organically uh, is originally organic energy. The subsistence level machinery of piety and drudgery is fueled by the repressed energies of orgasmic, sexual, ecstasy, and spiritual epiphany. Working labor can only be controlled and exploited in a situation where female reproduction labor, reprodu reproductive labor is equally controlled and exploited because both explanations are necessary to keep the exploitive machinery running. The female reproductive labor chronologically and ontologically is the first labor. Y'all ain't here. Y'all ain't heard. Okay. Y'all ain't heard. Anyway. Under world capitalizing patriarchy, the uterus is a factory. And the factory is a uterus. Oh! Mm -mm. And the enormous profits produced by their joint biological mechanical activities do not belong to the laborers, needless to say. They cannot take over their own productive reproductive systems. They are kept too busy and too tired, functioning at the subsistence level of mechanical piety and drudgery. In terms of evolutionary biology and of yoga, one could say that the large masses of people are being forcibly retained and maintained at the level of the reptile brain, the brain of ritualized repetition and benumbed violence. Kundalini is not allowed by um, by, primary, by primarily moral restrictions to rise up and illuminate this situation. Indeed, the reptile brain is kept strangely hypnotized from the outside 
by mass-produced dreams and commercial hallucinations of transcendence. The luminosity is on the entertainment screen while the evolutionary brain sits in darkness. What does all of this mean in relation to today's world and the three interlinked phenomena previously mentioned? First, everywhere in the world, governments are trying desperately to control and channel their populations to meet the economic pressures being put on them by the spread of global corporate developmental enterprise, especially the strain of domestic economies being deformed and de-energized by the numerous drain of military budgets. Whew. Pages of statistics exist to illustrate this phenomenon, but what is real? But what it really means is billions of female wombs and ovaries are being directly manipulated by their governments, and rarely in the interest of women involved. Government heads are seeking to increase or decrease populations in the interest of their own political careers and or to meet the demands of global corporate investors. As we've seen, a corporation like Mattel colludes with the Philippine government to promote sterilization among Filipino women workers. This ensures what corporations consider to be a more malleable and less demanding labor force in the free trade zone. It also puts numerical breaks on an increasingly revolutionary Filipino population. In Sri Lanka, Ceylon, um, Ceylon, the government also wants to reduce its population, especially for poor Tamil workers agitating for civil and economic rights. Forced sterilization occurs among female workers on the vast tea plantations. In Malaysia, on the, in Malaysia, on the other hand, the prime minister, Mahat, Mahath, Mahathria, Muhammad wants to increase his country's population to fill a labor shortage of native workers. He aims to swell Malaysia's population from 15 million to 70 million. And to do this, his government has launched an all-out program of maternity promotion, including repression of feminist groups working for uh, women's reproductive rights. In all cases, whether the plan is to increase or decrease populations, the, uh, the governmental political control of women's reproduct reproduction is directly related to the control of the labor force. Oh, y'all ain't heard. Uh-uh. To the labor force. In particular, since women workers can pro compose at least 80% of the light assembly workforce in the global free trade zones. <coughs> multinational corporations preferentially employ women workers because with the collusion of the host government, they can pay women lower wages and be also assured a docile population of workers conditioned by generations of religious social customs to obey males in authority and to engage in long hours of boring repetitive work without complaint, i.e. women workers trained in piety and drudgery. On a global scale, therefore, it is no longer possible to speak of labor force separate from women workers. And by the same token, it is no longer possible to analyze the management of poor of labor production separately from the management of female reproduction. Y'all ain't heard. <coughs> they are fast becoming one and the same. To control female reproduction and women's rights globally, it is necessary to control the rights of labor populations globally and vice versa. And, it, and the free trade zones are the spearheads or experimental models of this total global control with repressions of unions and political activity, along with the forced or coerced, cor cor coerced sterilization of women workers already built into their structures. As Anna Frentes and Barbara in, um, in, rink, in, in rink right point out in women in the global factory. Crudely put, the relationship between many third world governments and multinational corporations is like that of a pimp and his customers. The governments advise their women, sell them, um, advertise their women, and sell and keep them in line for multi multinational johns. They do this with the help of funding uh, received from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, which approve and bankroll this, this global arrangement. And an arrangement by which both the world's female population and the world's labor population are legally laid out for sexual economic use via the political and religious laws and customs of their home countries. <coughs> 
Actual sexual coercion happens frequently in the free trade zones, as it always has happened to women on the job with male bosses trading continued employment for sexual favors on the work tables. But the major sexual control and exploitation is and will be a total control of female reproduction by way of the workplace, i.e. via the economic, political needs and manipulations of the multinational corporations. Indigenous male governments worldwide to maintain uh, to maintain themselves in funds and power seem generally willing to loan out the bodies and lives of their female populations in this prostitutional way. And uh, what about the male populations of these countries? Unfortunately, come on now, y'all ain't here. Unfortunately, let's see, many of them can find employment only in the National Guards and the police forces. And, the, and, and in these occupations, they are frequently sent to work against the women workers, to break up labor sit-ins and organizational meetings, to destroy and punish any attempt on the part of female employees to form active unions or engage in political protest. It is the classic imperialist maneuver to dominate a people by turning a sufficient number of indigenous males into armed guards, policing and terrorizing their own people. In particular, the indigenous women, thus diverting sexual energy from revolution into repression. In Guatemala, in the Dominican Republic, in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in South Korea and Malaysia, national guards and police forces have been sent in by their governments to break up demonstrations, strikes, or simply meetings of female workers. In the, Dominic, uh, in the Dominican Republic, the dominant multinational corporation, Gulf and Western, sponsors its own goon squad, an indigenous male motorcycle gang, which specializes in terrorizing suspect, suspected union sympathizers. Quote, in Incon, South Korea, women at Dong Tu Textile Company, a producer of fabrics and yarn for export to the United States, had succeeded in gaining leadership in their own union locale in 1972. In 1978, the government-controlled male-dominated Federation of U uh, Korean Trade Unions sent special action squads to destroy the women's union. Armed with steel bars and buckets of human excrement, the goons broke into the office, smashed the office equipment, and smeared excrement all over the women's bodies and in their ears, eyes, and mouths, end quote. Classic labor organization strategy, long dominated by males, has been reluctant to consider political, the political importance of working women's issues and has been contemptuous of the theory put, forward, <coughs> put forth by some socialist Marxist women that female reproductive that female productive and reproductive labor is the primary producer of wealth, come on, and must be so structured into any effective labor theory and practice, come on. Classic revolutionary strategy, long dominated by males, has been equally reluctant to consider the political primacy of women of female issues. of female issues and equally contemptuous of the idea that a revolution should be mounted on the issue of women's oppression and liberation. But the spread of the global factory and this uh, consequent merger of women's reproductive issues with female workers' issues along, among a planetary multinationally controlled workforce of primarily exploited women, these classic labor the, uh, this, these classic labor left and revolutionary political male attitudes and positions have got to change. In the present situation, if males do not join with women workers to fight for female reproductive autonomy along with the workers' rights, then males have no other place to go except to go join the National Guard or the SWAT teams or the goon squads gearing up everywhere to help colonize and exploit their own countrywomen as slave workers and breeding machines. These are the only two options left for political men or in a totally politicized world for all men. So long as governments can control female reproduction in any way, the workforce can be equally controlled. Vice versa, it would be possible for governments and global corporations to totally control populations of workers so long as they are able to control populations of females as breeding machines or non-breeding machines. No one can be free unless females are free to control our own sex and our own reproduction. If we don't want... <coughs> 
If we don't control our own bodies, they are controlled by the boss and that keeps the boss in power forever. Some slaves can dominate and exploit the slavery of others, the classic imperialist situation, but no one will have a chance to be ontologically free. This is no longer the logic of feminism alone. It has expanded to become the inner logic of the multinational corporate marketplace and, and consequently the global factory structure and operations in relation to the international workforce. Second, how does fundamentalist religion fit into all of this? Clearly, it was patriarchal pastoralistic religion that originally sanctified and enforced the Bronze Age designation of women as breeding machines, as cattle. Yes, but cattle for the greater glory of God. It was the male priesthoods of the Father God religions who first wrote and enforced the new laws and new customs that stripped Neolithic women of all of their ancient sexual autonomy and made their sexual and reproductive functions the property of the dominating male elite for God and profit. It was, it was the Bronze Age priesthoods of Yahweh in particular who first wrote down and appealed moral sanctions, excuse me, and applied moral sanctions and religious justifications for the treatment of women as ontologically inferior beings, sacred only to the extent that we have or should have divine male sperm growing inside of us. In the first of the, uh, in the first excuse me, in the face of post-World War II feminism and a general desire on the part of many people in the Western world to liberate, to liberalize their religious ideas, and in particular to undemonize sexuality for both sexes, the modern fundamentalist priesthood has, re, um, has rebutted strongly, raising the banner of their Bronze Age counterparts of three and 4,000 years ago. The basic tenets of the Bronze Age priesthood being that one, human sex is sacred only for reproductive purposes, and two, women have nothing to say about it except, yes, master, woman, essentially evil, is sacralized only by lifelong sacrificial submission to the male sex and to reproduction. Thus speaketh the Bronze Age holy men of the 1980s. When Curtis Anton Bassetti was arrested for firebombing a feminist health clinic, an abortion clinic in Everett, Washington in 1984, he confessed to the police, I did it for the glory of God. In 1984, 24 abortion clinics or counseling offices in seven states were destroyed or heavily damaged by firebombs or arson. And there were 150 cases of vandalism and harassment. Don Benny Anderson, who is now serving 42 years in a, Wash uh, in a Wisconsin prison for a clinic bombing in suburban Washington, D.C., two bombings in Florida, and the kidnapping of an Illinois doctor who performed abortions, is also the man who coined the term Army of God, oh shit, <coughs> to describe the fundamentalist with a mission to stop abortion in America. Referring to the bombing so far, he said, these are just warning blasts. We are the embryonic, we are in the embryonic stages of civil war, holy war. Oh, the holy bombers of abortion clinics are utterly sincere in their beliefs. Furthermore, they are right. Their God does call for total control by men over the sexual and reproductive functions of women, extending far beyond the forbidden uh, the forbidding of abortion. Contraceptive, contraception of any kind is forbidden, or any method that would allow women to engage in non-reproductive sex for pleasure. Their God is the Bronze Age Father God of cattle breeders, the biblical Yahweh, for whom Hebrew women of those days were to be made as pregnant as possible to multiply his congregation. This did not spare pregnant women of other neighboring faiths, however, from having their bellies ripped up by holy heroes like King Menahem before he was established on the throne of Israel by the same God, according to uh, 2 Kings 15, 16. The Old Testament Yahweh was concerned with the fertility of Hebrew tribes, while simultaneously he did not hesitate to command and sanctify the slaughter of other people's tribes, including other people's children, suckling infants and fetuses i.e. pregnancy and population control, even in the Bible, were highly political. <clears throat> Be that as it may, fundamentalist Protestant and Catholic anti-abortionists are following the ways and dictates of their God. The rudimentary question remains, is their God the God? The feminist joke is, if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. The corollary to this is, if God is seen as female, the problem does not exist. That is, the entire question of sex, 
pregnancy, birth control, even abortion under an uh, ontologically somersault, ontological somersault, a revolution of basic terms. Just what God, who's God, what life, who's fertility, and who and what is defining God or life? Evolutionary, <clears throat> evolutionary biology shows that the human female alone alone among all of Earth's creatures is designed for non-reproductive orgasmic pleasure. Y'all do not want to hear that. See, this is the secret. Y'all do not want to hear that. Y'all do not want to hear that among every creature on the planet Earth, because y'all do not want to hear about the primacy, the supremacy of the human female evolutionarily. That is, that's, that's the shit. Y'all don't want to hear about it. Y'all don't want to know about it. And y'all damn sure can't accept it because, you know, even under the guise of all things being equal, you feel me? To talk about the human female, to talk about the human female as the, as the progenitor of all human evolution. Y'all can't accept it. Y'all can't accept it. A whole lot of y'all can't accept it. You understand? That's why y'all try to disrespect. Mm -hmm. Let me not go there. Let me not make y'all mad this, this evening. Listen. Evolutionary biology shows that the human female alone among all of Earth's creatures are, is designed for non-reproductive orgasmic pleasure. What I'm trying to tell you is, <coughs> what I'm trying to tell you is, is if you want to save the planet, you got to go back to the mother and not just in some ambiguous way. What we're talking about is, it is, <laughs> like in my estimation, it is going to be the mother's fucking orgasmic energy that has the ability to send the goddamn shockwaves through the planet that transforms human consciousness. That's what we're talking about. Because we can fight every war, man. Every revolution. Let me not go on there. Every revolutionary can fight every war and we still do not have the capacity to win. We have got... Let me stop. Anyway, in her development of the menstrual cycle and her breakaway from the estrus or the heat cycle of the mammalian world, the human female led led the way for all other advances of our species. Cone. Only human beings copulate for purposes other than species reproduction, for emotional bonding and expression, for personal pleasure, for personal confusion, for personal power and glory, personal revelation, while it is precisely the poor beasts who copulate only to reproduce. The fact that the human female can and does engage in non-reproductive copulation is exactly the fact that defines her and her partner as human. How could the fundamentalist fatherhood get it so wrong when they tell us from the Bible's pages or from the church's pulpit that human sex is sacred only if it tries to make babies and that otherwise the act reduces us to the level of beast? How could they have gotten it all so mixed up, so backwards? When the preachers of all of all time denounce Eve and through her all women for our innately lascivious and devilish sexuality, how is it that they make the horrible mistake of confusing what demonizes us with what humanizes us? <sighs> the answer is one because the page <clears throat> one because the Bronze Age priesthoods were members of pastoralist, tri pastoralist tribes and their new patriarchal ideas of God and of human intercourse derived from cattle breeding. Two, because the female sexual uh, autonomy represented the ancient Neil, uh, because female sexual autonomy represented the ancient Neolithic goddess religion, which these priesthoods had set out to demonize and destroy. The biblical God was indeed a jealous God. And it, it was precisely the goddess, her women, and human pleasure that he was jealous of. <clears throat> and 
And it was precisely because he and his priesthood set themselves against sexual pleasure that his own people kept backsliding. Father, the father gods and sun gods who emerged triumphant through force of arms and fan, fanaticism from Bronze Age, uh, from the Bronze Age, were concerned not with human pleasure, nor with human evolution, nor with human transcendence. They and their ruling priesthoods were concerned with power and with control. And the way to control human beings, the way to gain power over human biological energy and the energies of the human psyche is to dominate and control sexual and reproductive functions of women, period. Okay, that is all. That's the end of the book as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you understand? Like, it's not, but I'm just saying. That book in there, it, that would be the coup de top. Anyway. <clears throat> this is done by one trying to restrict sex only to reproduction or reproductive attempts and two taking control over the reproduction uh, over re over that reproduction away from women and handing it over to men who then piously mechanistically enact sex via the female body as a service to god the Christian religion historically and biblical fundamentalist of today, Christian, Islamic, or Jewish, must refute the evidence of evolution because they must refute the ontological primacy or rightness of the human female as she is. <coughs> as she is a sexual being. Fundamentalists must, one, deny evolution, insisting instead that human beings came fully formed from the hands of Yahweh, because two, they must deny the correctness of human sexuality the way that it is. Instead, they must insist it results from the fall through the sin of Eve, and this explains why human beings are so sexual, i.e. corrupt. Through this anti-evolutionary device, the Bronze Age priesthoods thus set up their pure God and a an asexual, anti-sexual, non-biological God against the sexual goddess, who represents the ontological emergence of human beings from and through billions of years of evolution into a conscious and spiritual sexual mode unique to us and thoroughly proper for us. Thus, the terrible irony that centuries of human ex existence in the name of distinguishing the human spirit from that of the lowly beast, the fundamentalist priesthoods has stupidly and brutally tried to restrict human sexuality, sexual activity, precisely to that of beast. It, is it ironic or has it been intentional? Sexual restriction and control, the, prob, uh, the, prom, the promulg promulgation and enforcement of moral codes based on sexual paranoia has been the machinery by which the priesthoods have kept themselves in power. Oh my God, y'all are not here. Have maintained control over human beings. Patriarchal religious power over the human mind and the human spirit has been achieved via the genitals. This is how the machinery of control and power works. The ontological coupling of female and male was broken apart <clears throat> and the organic sexual energy thus released was turned into the mechanistic energy of sexual hostility. This atom splitting was done by a male priesthood who defined woman and sex as evil and dangerous and then gave moral control over this evil situation to men who were, who was there, who was thereby rendered ontologically alien to himself, to woman, and to the entire natural world, because from that moment on, he owed his life and his pleasure to something he was supposed, he was supposed after, ever after to see as evil, corrupt, and hostile to his very soul, something like an animal or a plot of land he was supposed to both use and restrict as a God-appointed explorer and policeman. Oh my God. It was the classic imperialist device activated in the Bronze Age by the power-seeking male priesthood to divide and conquer, divide the spiritual man from the ontological woman, and then enroll him, enroll him as her policeman, her exploiter, her colonizer in the army of God for the profit of God and man, the totally colonized man, colonized 
by priestly ideology is thus appeased by giving him the female to colonize and his potentially revolutionary energy thus turned into repressed, repressive hostility against woman, against his other half, his mate, his mother, his holistic self. And this is how the divine homosexual family of the patriarchal priesthoods maintains its power, an enormous and seemingly endless power. <clears throat> this is a very long chapter. I think I'm going to stop there for the evening and maybe pick it back up in the morning or something. But um, for those who may join later, this is a reading um, of the Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth by Monica Zhu and Barbara Moore. We are reading the chapter called The Machine. Um, and this is um, this digression that I'm doing in chapter 49 is in light or in lieu of um, the news coming down the pike about the reversal of Roe versus Way. And um, this book was written in 1983, so, I mean, 1987. So I hope that that was um, helpful. The, the chapter is very long. I'm going to continue reading it. Um, but that's the question of the day. You know, I did a, a live not too long ago talking about this, um, this brother who, you know, progressive dude, you understand, told me that um, this was a few months ago during Women's History Month. <clears throat> that um, um, that he wasn't going to go support the women's history rally downtown because um, that's a quote that's a that's a woman that's a woman's thing and y'all got it so I'm gonna sit it out. And I did this live because I was really disappointed and frustrated and confused by that position. And he, this has been an ongoing struggle of women to um to really um help men to see that they are as profoundly um, <coughs> they have been just as profoundly victimized, brutalized, and um, yeah, by patriarchy as women have. And the evidence of that is to see yourself separate from the suffering of women, to not see the suffering of women of half the fucking population of the planet Earth as having some direct impact on your life, to not internalize as one who has come through the suffering of women that your existence came through the suffering of a woman that your body is half female and you can take a position like that's y'all shit to work out y'all figure it out y'all got it y'all got it you understand and it has been you know that's the programming that's the programming of patriarchy is to have you split yourself in half i'm talking to men to split yourself in half, to dichotomize your own consciousness, spirit, and soul, to see that you are somehow apart from, away from the suffering of women, and to not see your salvation in resolving the suffering of women, to not see the reclamation of your own whole humanity in the resolution of the suffering of women or that which causes the suffering of women, no matter what the fucking issue is, whether we say it's, you know, menstrual taboos or whether we say it's, you know, abortion or whatever that you have to have, maybe that's what solidarity is. It's standing on the side of the oppressed in a way that is indicative of your own life being on the line. That's it. So this reading is really timely. I hope, like, I live in LA. I don't know if you can hear the helicopters in the background, but yesterday there was a demonstration of upwards of 10,000 people in the streets of LA. 
and this, you know, this mega funded fucking police force came through just as the state would have it to, you know, to come down like the fucking plague on people rallying to defend the rights of women to say what is right for our own bodies and our own lives and our own futures. So, you know, the last, and, and they were prepping for it because I had just been telling my daughter a few weeks ago, I was like, I haven't seen as many fucking pigs in this city since I got here four years ago. I've seen more cops in the last three weeks than I've seen all together in the last four years. So this shit was coming down the pike. You understand? They've been prepping. And then the city council is about to approve you know, another increase in the fucking police budget, bringing the police budget up to three to three point two billion dollars for LAPD, just the city. You understand what I'm saying? And so, you know, my homeboy had been trying to get me to get the fuck up out of here. He's like, some shit about to come down the pike. These motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying? And he wasn't wrong. He was. I heard fifteen fucking cop helicopter helicopters fly over goddamn Hollywood. I live in Hollywood. Looks like for luge out this bitch right now. You understand what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. Anyway, I digress. But yeah, um, join me tomorrow. I'm going to finish reading this chapter. It'll probably take a couple of days. The chapter is exceptionally long, but it's timely. Book written in 1987. It's timely. It is a collusion between religious ideologies of all branches. They all got damn guilty. They all um, collude with co-sign on uphold the oppression that we experience and we think we only experience it politically or economically or socially right so you've got these mega corporations and industrialists right <clears throat> so-called global talk the corporatocracy or whatever the fuck y'all be calling it these days colluding with the church and colluding with the government this is it this is it in real time 50 years later, having this conversation, she read, she wrote the book. They wrote the book. People was like, these bitches crazy. And here we are looking in real time at the reversal of Roe versus Wade. But I'm going to tell you, the reason this is happening, the reason this is able to happen is because y'all didn't make no stink when they was talking about reversing the Voter Right Act. Y'all, there wasn't no giant outcry. Not from white allies, sure wasn't. Not from feminists, sure wasn't. Because they ain't had nothing to do with y'all. See, that was about the black folks. Child, <coughs> this is real life we dealing with. And I've been telling y'all for a little over a year now, this shit is about to get real fucking deep. Real deep. Y'all mad about Roe versus Wade. We still got a year, over a, two years of this shit left. And somebody's gonna have to be, somebody's gonna have to be bodacious enough and um, fucking renegade enough to say this shit is not working. Fuck the goddamn Supreme Court. Fuck the goddamn electoral process of the United States. Fuck the goddamn Constitution of the United States. We have to scrap all this shit and rebuild a new world. That's it. <coughs> there is no way to make right shit was created to work and function exactly how it does. There is no way to make right to redeem some shit that functions and functions well exactly how it was created to. To exploit, to immiserate, to fuck up, to destroy the lives of human beings for the sole purpose of fucking profit. You understand? Not only do we have to say we have to scrap all this shit, <coughs> we have to call these goddamn religious institutions to task because they have had their hands in it since day one. They are not innocent, not one of them. If it is a religious institution that has in its in its essence anywhere the exploitation of women, the subjugation of women, the reduction of the significance of women in the creative process, they are guilty. 
They are guilty in what we are experiencing politically and economically and socially. They are guilty because those philosophies are the ones that taught us that to accept our lowliness, that taught us to accept that this is our lot in life, that taught us to accept that the state is ordained by God, that the police are inherently good and shit. All of them got to be called to task. God damn it. All of them. Every last one of them. We've been tiptoeing around the sensitivities of goddamn religious institutions for forever. And where does it, where has it gotten us? Goddamn. What is it? May of 2022. And these motherfuckers want to thrust us backwards into barbarism. But, but you know what? Y'all mad. Y'all on the streets of LA about the tens and the thousands. And just as many of y'all is out here mad about the reversal of Roe versus Wade, there are just as many of these fucking right wing ass Christians out in the streets celebrating and popping bottles and shit as if they done won some great moral goddamn victory. Shh. I got family members <clears throat> I know right now today thanking the Lord for this goddamn madness for this travesty because they hate women so much they cannot even conceive of women having control over their own goddamn lives and bodies and destiny Shh. Give all the care and praise to. You know, mm, anyway, I digress. So I'm gonna come back tomorrow and finish reading the chapter called "The Machine," um, in lieu of this profoundly fucked up incident that has happened over the last couple of days. Um, my name is Yapo Engina Cassandra Floyd, also known as the Road Black Girl. I will tune back in tomorrow. Hope you all have a good evening. Peace.